Hello everyone, this is Wes Sisko and welcome to RT Tech Connect. Today's featured product is the Bradford White Brute FT Boiler. The Brute FT has many features. It features a fully modulating burner up to a 10 to 1 turn-on ratio and 95% efficiency. The stainless steel fire tube heat exchanger is a down-fired heat exchanger. This also has a DHW heat exchanger with storage for their combi model. There are two models. The models are space heating only, and then the combi space heating and also domestic hot water generation. There's also a floor model, the FT floor combi. It only comes as a combi. So this model is gonna be space heating and also domestic hot water generation. There are nice things that about this floor model that I like to point out. One is, if you don't have the luxury of having a flat surface to mount a boiler on, then the floor model is gonna be perfect for you. In case you got like a stone wall or you don't have any space to cobble up a false wall, this FT floor model, perfect application. The 199 Combi can deliver 4.8 GPMs at a 77 degree rise and also a 5.2 GPM at a 72 degree rise. So here's my favorite page, a speck at a glance. Kind of brings everything home. I'm looking at four straight heating models. That's going to be anything from 80,000 all the way up to 199,000. And I'm also looking at two combi models. One, one at 140,000, the other is at 199,000. So we have to look at these things called turndown ratios. On those straight heat models, right, the first three are going to be from 80,000, 100,000, and 140, a 5 to 1 turndown ratio. Also, the 140 combi is a 5 to 1 turndown ratio. But if I'm looking at the 199s, now things change a little different. You know, I'm now at 10 to 1 turndown ratio. And what does that all mean to me? Well, you see it's 95% efficiency across all boilers, right, as far as B2 ranges, and also whether straight heat and or combi. But let's look at some turndowns and what does it really mean to you? Well, now we have some flexibility to go across the, the, the span of the B2 range, which what I'm saying is this. If I have a building calling for heat and it needed 80,000 BTU straight heat only, and say that it's not the coldest day now and only a couple of rooms are calling and it's 20,000 BTUs required, then I know I can turn this, this boiler can go all the way down to 16,000 BTUs, but yet I only need, you know, 20,000. So it's going to float just above its lowest point of turn down and save a lot of money, economy of operation. So basically it almost right sides itself for that application another great benefit of the Brute FT. Another thing I'd like to point out is when you're looking at uh, the straight heat models compared to your combi models between the supply and return tappings, just something to point out, on the heating only models, you have an inch and a quarter for supply and return on the taps, right? That's threaded tap sticking out of the unit. On the combis, it's one inch, so be careful there. So if you happen to be a guy putting combis in, you know, you're using combis, 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 and it's all one inch, and then you happen to do a straight heat model. Well, remember, you have to upsize that um, piping two inch and a quarter. The next thing is venting. Venting is pretty cool in these because of the way things are set up. You're looking at 50 straight linear feet, including your fittings and all your fitting equipment fitting, but two inch can go 50 feet, three inch can go 100 feet on a two inch each fitting, each 90 is eight feet equivalent length, 45s are four feet equivalent lengths. And if you're looking at three inch, each 90 is five feet, 45s are two and a half feet equivalent length. When you're looking at venting, two inch, 50 feet, and at three inch, you can go 100 feet. And don't forget your elbows and your 45, so each elbow at two inch is gonna be eight feet equivalent length, 45s at two inch are gonna be four feet equivalent length. At three inch, you're looking at five feet equivalent length for 90s, and for each 45, you're looking at two and a half feet. When it comes to venting, each model can be vented out with PVC, CPVC, polypropylene, or AL294C stainless steel. Shipping weight, let's get into a little of the weights. Now, these are wall-hung models. If you're looking at the wall-hung model, you're like 98 pounds, 98 pounds, that's gonna be your 80 and your 100,000. And you go all the way up to your 199s as a combi at 130 uh, pounds. This is not problematic when it comes to, you know, setting this on the wall. Put your anchors up, put your bracket up, put the unit hangs there, bolted at the bottom, 
and then away you go. Warranty. You're looking easily at a, a 10 year warranty, limited warranty on the heat exchanger and five years on parts. There's also a service bag that can be purchased too with all the uh, what I call critical parts. So what's under the hood? Well, let's take a look. I see a modulating gas valve, a high performance inducer blower, optical flame sensor, gas leak detector, and the ability to do outdoor reset. Also a condensate trap, pressure switch, low water cutoff, and also filled convertible from natural LP. The conversion kit comes with the units. Your main control, your integrated circulator on board, and also an automatic air vent comes with the unit. And if you're looking for anything as far as servicing, all the O-rings, spare parts, seals, gaskets, they all come with every unit. They also make a service bag that comes with all the critical service parts needed. Uh, once again, 10 years on the heat exchanger and five years on parts. So what's included? Well, condensate hose, wall anchors, brackets, pressure relief valve. Also on the 140 model, 140,000, there's gonna be a belt coupling. And that's gonna be a three quarter by half for your gas line. The tapping on the unit, it's gonna, it's gonna feed out at half inch. So then you're gonna increase that size up to three quarter. Then you'll see the Spears parts kit, outdoor sensor, and also your propane conversion orbs. The fire tube heat exchanger, second to none on the market. 316 stainless steel. Each one of those fire tubes, you'll see the little fingers on the inside. Those fingers actually extract more heat out of the combustion and put more heat into the water. Excellent heat exchanger. Nice, large surface, nice conduction to heat. Let's talk about how the water flows through the system. As you can see, it comes in on the return side, goes up through the heat exchanger, gains heat, and then falls over to a shell and tube domestic hot water shell and tube heat exchanger. This is on our combi models only. Comes out of that shell and tube and then goes out to space heating. So any space heating call is gonna cause the shell and tube to heat up. So if there's a call for hot water, if there's a demand for hot water, it's always readily available. And that's gonna eliminate that cold water sandwich. So once we purge the line of our you know, room temperature water, you're gonna get Boom, boiler temperature or say that domestic set temperature that you need, that on-demand temperature, and as much as you need. The shell and tube heat exchanger, it has a corrugated um, coil on the inside. That's going to be where the domestic water is being stored. And that corrugation is made to turbulate the water. So if there's any suspended particles, it won't allow them to stick to the sidewall. So when it comes down to descaling, this would be the last thing to descale. So another great benefit of the Brute FT. So what the boiler does is maintain 158 degrees in that shell and tube. So if there's a call for, for a uh, hot water demand, instantly you're gonna get hot water once you purge out that room temperature, uh, room temperature water. So how efficient is this heat exchanger? Well, it's very efficient. And that's gonna be two things to consider. Flow rate, and your inlet water temperature. So the warmer the water temperature is and the lower the rise, the more flow you can get out of this unit. For instance, if we're looking at 5.7 GPM at a 65 degree rise, but I only have 40 degree water coming in, then I'm gonna generate 105 degree water. But if I have 55 degree water coming into the system, I'm looking at 120 degrees, so way more than what I need, and that's gonna be constant. Sizing my DHW loop. In this case, I have two showers. Both are at 2.5 GPM or a total of 5 GPM. If I'm thinking about my blended factor of 0.85 or say 85% of my blended when I'm using at the fixture is gonna be hot water, then my true demand is 4.25 gallons of hot water. So how's that all equate out? Let's do some math. One is, if I know my domestic incoming water is gonna be 55 degrees, that's my water service, and my DHW is set at 125 degrees, then my temp rise at 70 degrees would yield me 5.3 GPM. So in this case, I'm looking at a 70 degree, 5.3 GPM, and I can maintain that temperature and that flow constantly. As long as the boiler's firing, I can get that flow rate and maintain that 125 degrees. 
Now say I had a heat only model. Does that mean I can't have hot water? Domestic hot water? No, it doesn't. So what I can do is use a straight heat, brute FT, and combine it with a power store, indirect fired water heater, has a huge heat exchanger, 14.2 square feet, 1.5 feet of head as far as pressure drop through it. So your, your average run of mill circulator have zero problem going through it. This thing will deliver a lot of hot water. And with this water heater, it has three anode rods and a lifetime warranty. These are the things I want to kind of point out to you. Comes with your aquastat, your immersion type aquastat, temperature and pressure relief valve, dielectric fittings, and also three anode rods. So for the original owner, lifetime warranty. Can't go wrong with a lifetime warranty. So the onboard controls. There's two ways you can set up these boilers, whether it's going to be straight heat or combi. They can be set up either basic, set point, regular boiler, no problem, cold start. From room temperature all the way up to one temperature, say 180 degrees, we're taking care of fan coils, taking care of baseboard, something like that, not a problem whatsoever. Or we can set it up for outdoor reset. With an outdoor reset, now we have to figure out four points. We're gonna figure out the coldest temperature I want the system to ever run down to as far as the coldest my uh, central heating is gonna be water and then also I have to consider my highest temperature my central heating water is going to be. So let's say that I had something like I want to go from 70 degrees to 180 degrees and then I have to figure out those other two points. The other two points are when do I need 70 degrees and when do I need 180 degrees? Well on my coldest day maybe it's zero so when it's zero out then the control is going to know at zero make 180 degrees in my boiler water right and send that out to the system. But on my colder days, say I'm going to have something like a 70 degree day. On my 70 degree days, I'm going to make 70 degree water. Just so it happens to work out that way. The other thing it can do is 0 to 10 volts input. So if you have a building management system and you're feeding 0 to 10 volts, the only thing you'd have to set up in control is going to be the highest water temperature that it can make and the lowest water temperature that it can make. And that 0 to 1, I'm sorry, that 0 to 10 is going to dictate exactly where it falls on the curve as far as the temperature of water it makes. Piping. Now, the boiler, this Brute FT, I'm noticing that, you know, when I'm looking through the instructions, it says everything about primary secondary piping. Some people can get a little confused about primary secondary piping, so what do we do? Well, we made it easy. We have these piping manifolds that you can actually buy and attach directly, and they're spaced out directly for the units. And in this case, you happen to be looking at the one for straight heat because you'll see the side tappings for an indirect tank. Also, you'll see that, you know, you have some isolation and purge valves there, and that gets you right into your primary loop. We talked about this before, but let's go over it again. When you're looking at venting, three inch, you can go 100 feet, maximum six elbows. You may remember each elbow is going to be equivalent to five feet in three inch. And if you're looking at the two inch combustion and also your air coming in, as far as your makeup air, you max out of 50 feet. Now you can have up to four elbows and remember each elbows now at two inch are eight feet. Now there's a couple things you need to do. When you're looking on the, on the uh, control itself, there's a set of dip switches. On these dip switches, and it seems confusing, but don't be confused, I'll show you it's very easy. When using two inch vent, the dip switch in the fourth position, dip switch number four, must be in the off position. Hence, if I'm using three inch, then the dip switch number four is in the on position. Anytime I change a dip switch before I make that change, I want to make sure I power off the Brute FT. And that way when I power back on, it recognizes the new change. Direct venting. We can come directly out of the side wall. The one thing I want you to notice here is going to be the distance between your inlet and your outlet, your exhaust. Minimal is going to be 12 inch. What we don't want to have is cross contamination. We don't want to have the exhaust coming out and being sucked right into the intake of the unit. The unit's going to gum up, it's going to shut down, it's going to be a bad burn all the way around. Nobody's going to be happy. So respect the, the 12 inch, okay, and then we're looking at some other things too, as you'll see the other dimensions. 6 inch minimal, 24 inches away from the wall maximum. This is set up like your normal direct vent. Also, there's a snorkel type. Snorkel type direct vent, once again, you're looking at 
12 inch between the two. Make sure you get no cross contamination and then abide by local code. If you're one of those who likes to use concentric vent kits, not a problem. That can be easily done too. Now let's go back to what we talked about earlier about the pressure switch. The pressure switch has a transducer type pressure switch. So if you happen to come off of a different plane, say that I'm exhausting the sidewall and I'm intaking from the roof or, or opposite, exhausting to the roof, intaking from the side, that's gonna be two different planes, two different pressure differentials. And at that point, the transducer pressure switch can pick that up and adjust the, adjust the controls to make sure the unit is working optimally. Now let's talk about fuel pressure. There are some things that we need to figure out before we install anything. One is gonna be what is the pressure coming in as far as fuel pressure that I have supplied. Well, if I'm looking at natural gas, the minimal pressure is three and a half water columns and the maximum pressure is 10 and a half water columns. But if I'm in LP, then I'm looking at a minimal pressure of eight water columns and also 13 inches water columns when you're looking at LP on the maximum. So a manometer is gonna be your best friend there. You can measure that directly off the gas valve on the manifold side. Now, gas pipe sizing. Now, we remember we're at 199,000 BTUs, so in this case, we're looking at natural gas. And if I'm looking at three quarter inch and looking at a 190,000 BTUs, and it says 20 feet can handle 190,000 BTUs, then I know I cannot handle 199, so I have to bump that up to one inch if I'm at natural gas. And that's not including the fittings, because as you see, the equivalent length on fittings too, so we have to also account for those. Now, propane burns a little hotter. If I'm looking at propane and I'm at 199, now half inch, 200,000 BTUs, 20 feet, provided that the fittings, okay, are no more than 20 feet, including the pipe itself, then of course I can handle that on a half inch. But if not, then of course I have to move up to three quarters of an inch, and if, if you see that can handle 418,000 BTUs, so that'll be zero problems for these units. Boiler piping. Boiler piping always comes into, well, what happens when you take out a, a non-condensing boiler, say an atmospheric boiler, and you're in direct return, which means that you had a dedicated line supply, dedicated line coming back to the unit on the return side, and neither did the two ever touch. Common piping was gonna be the component would be the boiler itself. So in this case, if I'm doing that, I can take and put a bridge between my supply and my return prior to the boiler. If I bridge this, then that becomes primary secondary piping. And now the onboard circulator will circulate only through the boiler and that associated piping across the bridge and nothing else will be affected. Anything happening in the primary loop past, um, out, you know, outside the boiler loop, then that's going to be secondary to anything happening inside the boiler, which means they're hydronically separated. They're two different worlds. And how do I explain that? Well, the best way is kind of like this graphic. If you're looking at this graphic here, just say I have a primary loop. This primary loop is running, I've boiler water coming out nice and hot, circulating around the loop. And the secondary loops, you have one up top and one down the bottom on the right hand side. And you'll see I'll bring that first one on, let's call it mix one. So this loop here is now seeing flow, but the only reason it's seeing flow is because it's being pulled in from that primary loop by that, set, that circulator in the center. In that secondary loop, you'll see the circulator is moving a lot faster and circulating water. If I bring on the next loop, boom, there you go. Same thing happening, but now this water temperature is gonna be a little lower temp because coming out of that primary, down that, that um, common leg of these two mixed loops, you're gonna see a lower water temperature because some's gonna be used up in that first secondary loop. Some of the rules of primary secondary piping. Well, some of the things we have to consider. One is closely spaced T's. How close can they be? Well, the rule is four pipe diameters or six inches, they can never be too close. So the more you spread them apart, the worse the scenario could get if it's you know considering what they call ghost flows. So I wanna make sure that I'm at least 12 inches, okay, or closer. So the true rule is six inches or four pipe diameters. 
and then you want to have what they call a delta P, difference in pressure, you will have a nice closed loop between your primary and your secondary loop, which means they're hydraulically separated. One does not affect the other. The drop from the elbow, okay, on your primary loop to your first takeoff on your closely spaced tees should be a 12 inch drop. And then of course, going away from that secondary, the return side of my secondary on my closely spaced tees, spaced tees should also be another 12 inches. If I have to have a thermal drop, that thermal drop leg should also be 12 inches if I'm looking at a thermal drop, if I'm coming off the side of what I consider that primary loop. If I'm coming off the top of the primary loop, then I once again have to worry about thermal trapping. If I come off the bottom of the primary loop, then the thermal trapping is already taken care of because now the primary is the hottest water in the system. Can I cascade them? Yes, I can. There's a cascading kit required. You'll have to you know, order the, the cascade kit. That's gonna be the connecting wires, the cascading cables, and you can cascade up to eight units. They're gonna be set up in such a way where one unit's gonna be the lead and the rest of the units will be the followers. So in this case, if you we were looking at boiler one, that would be the lead. If we happen to do, these are straight heat units and you're looking at um, indirect fire water heater coming off that first unit, you can only have one indirect coming off of that first unit. You can't do anything off those following units. So the way the system works is that with that cascading system, it's going to even out the run times for all boilers. So if the primary boiler is calling because there's domestic load, then also there's space heating calling, then if the primary is taking care of some, some domestic water heating and also trying to take care of space heating, you may have to bring on a second, third, or even a fourth boiler. So these are going to be staged, which is really nice because now instead of one big boiler, you have a modular effect of, of taking care of that same heating load. So you're efficiently taking care of that heating load. And for outdoor reset, you would add the sensor to the north face side of the building above the snow line, and you would adjust the curve based on the parameters that you set. There are four parameters that you will set. One will be the temperature that you want the boiler to be at the highest point, the maximum, and also the lowest temperature you want in the boiler. So let's look at these four points. One will be the max temperature, in this case, 180 degrees. The lowest temperature would be 150 degrees. And then we'd say the outdoor temperature, when it's 50 degrees out, we want 150 degrees in the boiler. And when it's 20 degrees out or colder, we want 180 degrees in the boiler. So this way I set up these four points and then the unit will slide. And so it will slide across the reset curve. And that means that the colder it gets outside, the hotter the boiler temperature will be. There's two power buttons that I want you to be familiar with on the Brute FT. One is just below the main circuit board. That power button power, that controls the power to the unit itself. With that power toggled on, and then there's another power button on the display, the display um, power button will toggle the display on and off. If you toggle off the display button without toggling off the main power, be careful, there's still line voltage within the chassis of the boiler. So let's now go into setting up our central heating temperature. First, we're gonna do what? We're gonna turn the display board on if it's not on. We're gonna select central heating and that's gonna be the button with the thermometer. And then we're gonna now take the center button and scroll to the temperature we'd like to select. Once we get to our temperature, we then push that scroll button in. It's also a select button. We can do the same thing for DHW, your domestic hot water requirement. So we can slide over and push the button that's got the little handheld device next to it. We're gonna scroll around till we get to the temperature we like, then we're gonna select it. If we need to go to high temp above 120 degrees, then we're gonna select that, the uh, DHW button again, but we're gonna hold it for about five seconds. Then it's gonna say high and a little H next to it, and then I'm gonna scroll that all the way up to 140 degrees. As I stated before, the outdoor reset 
you first must install the outdoor sensor. And that's gonna be also located on the outside of the building on the north face side. And then you're gonna go ahead and put it into installer mode. And the way you do that is you're gonna power the unit off. That's gonna be the power of the display button. Then you're gonna hold your mode button until you get to the installer mode. Once you get there, you'll go around to the parameters and you'll look at the max outdoor temperature. So get to where you need, make that selection. You'll do the same thing for minimal outdoor temperature, warm weather shut off, and you select them appropriately. Once again, we're setting the temperature of when the boiler is gonna need the hottest water and also the temperature when the boiler needs the lowest amount of water as far as temperature. Once we get those set, the next thing to do is let's measure CO2. Well, before I measure CO2, the first thing I want to do is take my manometer and check the incoming uh, gas pressure to my gas valve. Remember, there's minimums and maximums depending on its natural gas or LP as stated here on this graphic. The next thing is we're going to look at our dip switch locations and we're going to put it in dip switch number seven position to the on position, which is min fire lock in to min fire. Once that's locked into min fire, I'll remove the plug from my uh, vent pipe on my exhaust side. And I go ahead and put my combustion analyzer and start taking my reading. Remember the reading I want on low fire for natural is gonna be between eight and a half percent to 10 and a half percent. If it's LP on low fire, it'd be 9.5% to 11%. I'm going to make this measurement. If I fall within its parameters based on the fuel I'm using, then I'm done. You know, normalize it back up, put switch number seven in its normal operation position, which is in the off position, and I'm off to the races. If not, um, then I have to go through the whole parameters again. So let's say, for instance, I had the low, the low fire set it's, I made the adjustments within the parameters. I take it out of low fire, I lock it now into high fire, and I check the parameters again. Now in high fire, for natural gas, it's 8% to 10%. Well, if it falls within its parameters, I'm good to go. Once again, like I said, off to the races. If not, if it's right for low fire, but not right for high fire, I have to make an adjustment. As you see here on the graphic, that's where I make my adjustment in the adjustment port, and that's only in low fire only. So I'll go through the low fire adjustment and it's a small tweak. Please don't go, you know, nilly willy. It's a small, small tweak. Once you get it within its parameters, then you go ahead and check it in high fire. If it works out then, close the cover, you're good to go. And with more than five years of a proven track record and more than 10,000 installations across the nation, the Brood FT has proven itself as a very reliable boiler. You also are backed by Bradford White and their 24 hours assistance. And that's why for me, the Brood FT is the boiler for you.